Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you, Lily, for that reading and reading so beautifully, such an amazing passage, part of which we looked at last week and part of which we'll look at here together today. And just want to say, whether you're joining us on our Facebook page, on YouTube channel, or our website, we're glad that you're with us, tuning in as we talk about what it means uh, to choose joy from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Before we jump into the passage, let's play a little game. Let's do a little exercise in perspective, in how we see things. I'm going to show you a series of images, and I'm going to ask you what you see first. Are you ready? And you can uh, let us know in the comments which one you see first. Ready first. Here we go. Do you see a rabbit? Or a duck? Which one do you see first? Both images are there. Do you see the rabbit's ears or the beak of a duck? How many of you saw a rabbit first? How many of you saw a duck first? Okay, next image. Ready? Do you see lips or a leaf? Both images are there if you have eyes to see. Which one did you see first, the lips or a leaf? <laughs> Maybe you're thinking, I don't see either of these things yet, Pastor Jeff. All right, third image. Okay, ready? Do you see men or a series of pillars? How many of you see white pillars or the shadows of men in black? Again, hopefully you see at least one of those images. Last, and this one is probably familiar to many of you. It's a more complicated image, but which of you see an old woman with a large nose and her chin down there? Or how many of you see a young woman with her face turned slightly away from us? Hopefully you see one of those too. Interestingly, in each of those images, and it's fun to Google search these things, all, both images are present. It's a matter of our perspective. It's a matter of how we see things. In the passage from Philippians chapter 4, we're going to examine, there's a sense in which Paul is training us to see, to look differently, to see things differently. I'm going to read again verses 8 and 9. We heard Lily read the whole passage, verses 4 through 9 of chapter 4, but let's read again. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the kind of passage that gets put on, um, you know, Instagram posts, it gets on Pinterest, it gets embroidered on pillows, uh, we, we plaster it all over the place. As a matter of fact, I took this little plaque off the bathroom wall of my kid's bathroom, uh, and it says, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, think about these things. It's an, it's an abbreviation of Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. We've hung it up there above the mirror in our kid's bathroom for years. Hopefully it made some difference. Who knows? But this is really deep spiritual wisdom for us. It's much more than what's embroidered on a pillow or stamped on a, on a social media post. And I don't want us to let our familiarity with this passage, at least verse 8 anyway, to prevent us or cause us to miss its real power in our lives. There's a spiritual principle running through these two verses that we need to understand. Here's the principle. You are what you think most and most deeply about. You are what you think most and most deeply about. Who you are, who you're becoming as a person, is directly connected to what fills your mind and where your mental energy goes, what you think about most. 
It impacts your character. It impacts your life, your whole outlook. In fact, there's no genuine or lasting change. There's no transformation of heart and mind and life apart from a transformation of how we think. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans 12, verse 2. He says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed, Paul says so clearly, by the renewing of your mind. Most of us think that transformation happens by sheer effort, a willpower, I work hard, and certainly our will has something to do with it. But the Bible indicates that a changed life begins in how you think, with a renewal of our minds. The ideas, the images in men's minds are the invisible powers that constantly govern men's lives. Jonathan Edwards said that, and I think it's so profound. The ideas and images in our minds are the invisible powers that constantly govern our minds. A.W. Tozer put it this way, the most important fact about any of us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. Or if you like, Mark Twain wrote this, what a wee little part of a person's life are his acts and words. His real life is led in his head and is known to none but himself. All day long the mill of his brain is grinding and his thoughts are his true history. Now, I would never deny that our actions matter, and Paul's going to get to that. He's talking about where it begins is in how we think. As a matter of fact, there's a whole uh, aspect, there's a whole field of psychology called positive psychology. Uh, Martin Heligman is the founder and the father of positive psychology. And he basically said, historically, psychologists have studied only unhappy people. What would happen if we did a comprehensive study of happy people, of joyful people? And so they did this for decades, studied happy people. And you know what they found? These five practices they all had in common, meditation and prayer, gratitude, acts of kindness and service, healthy relationships, and balance in their life. Gee, think about that. All of those things are present in the New Testament, in the teachings of Jesus. They're actually all present in the book of Philippians, which we're studying. The field of positive psychology is just catching up to what the Bible's been saying all along. But don't make the mistake. This is not talking about the power of positive thinking. It's talking about something much, much deeper than that. Paul is talking about here in Philippians is much greater than just the power of positive thinking. In fact, when he says, think about these things in verse 8, the Greek word for think is the word logizomai. The first part is where we get our English word logic from. It's a compound word, and it means to deeply consider, reflect, reckon, dwell on, meditate, focus your mind and your thoughts on something. You cannot expect the peace of God to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You remember last week we talked about verse 7. The peace of God will guard our minds. The peace of God cannot guard our minds if we're filling our minds with thoughts and ideas and images that are far from the things of God. If, there, if we're filling our minds with the opposite of purity and goodness and justice and truth and beauty and honor, then how can the peace of God guard our minds? So verse 8 is really answering how verse 7 works. By the time the average American reaches age 65, we will have watched eight consecutive years of television, TV and computer screens, not including your phone. Eight years. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for eight years. By the time you're 65, that's how many years you'll spend watching a screen. On average, uh, the average American Christian spends 15 minutes a day or less thinking about spiritual, with spiritual input, reading their Bible, listening to a sermon. And they spend six hours a day or more with TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Netflix, TV, phone. Ten minutes a day versus six hours a day. Which one's going to have the more profound shaping influence on your life? That's not a trick question. It's simple math. If it's true that how we think has the most profound impact on how we live and who we become, then we have to take stock of what we're filling our minds with. So let me present us with a challenge. 
before we jump into the specifics here, for both the remainder of this sermon and for the rest of this week. And as long as it lasts, here's the challenge. Allow verses 8 and 9 of Philippians 4 to shine a light on any area of your life that God may want to address. Allow verses 8 and 9 to be sort of the, the lens by, and the filter by which you examine your own life, your thoughts and your actions. Because Paul's saying, I want your whole life, the way you think, the way you live, all of it to be shaped by these things, these virtues, and that requires intentionality and focus of the mind. Richard Foster writes this, The decision to set the mind on the higher things is an act of the will. That is why it is called a discipline. It's not something that falls into our heads. It's a result of a consciously chosen way of thinking and living. So let's take that challenge. Let's consciously choose to place our minds, our thoughts, and our actions under the lens of Scripture. Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Okay, before we work through this list, I want you to notice that Paul uses the word whatever six times. Whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, he says. This means that he's speaking in comprehensive terms. Paul's saying, wherever you find it, whenever you come across it, wherever you look in the world, think about these things. Implying we should be on the lookout for these virtues, searching for them. Of course, of course, primarily, foundationally, and fundamentally, they're found in Scripture, in God's revealed truth to us. But they're not only found here. Paul's saying wherever, whatever is, these things, just, commendable, lovely, pure, right, think about them. Evaluate them. Turn them over in your mind. Reflect on them. Be on the lookout I just, just stop there for a minute. What if we lived that way? What if we were on the lookout for the good all the time? i got to be honest. I think these days I'm on the lookout for the bad. I'm bracing for the next bit of bad news. Paul's saying, as Christians, living in uncertain times, which he was and the Philippians were far more than we are, be on the lookout for the good. Okay, let's walk through the list now together. First, whatever is true. Whatever is true. Truth, that which corresponds to reality and to the revelation of Scripture. All truth, we say, is God's truth. It belongs to him. There's no truth outside of him. Therefore, we should expect to find evidences and reflections and glimpses of God's truth in all kinds of places, in all areas of life, in all disciplines, even sometimes from sources and individuals who reject God outright. They can still speak truth because God is the God of truth. They may not speak the whole truth or even know where their truth comes from. Nevertheless, as people of the truth, we should be able to see, recognize, and attribute the truth wherever we find it to the author of truth, to God himself, and not be afraid of that. One of the things I notice right now in our culture, and I'm guilty of this too, is that we look around and if I disagree with somebody on one issue, then I can't listen to them on any issue. Why is that? That's wrong. As Christians, I should be able to say... Well, this, we may disagree about this, but some, they may speak truth. They may reflect God's character in some other area. We all need a continual input of the truth in order to do this well. Friends, let me just challenge you. Read Scripture every day. Read the Word of God every day. We're in the midst of 22 days of prayer right now, and you can join us online. You can go back and start, and start your own 22 days because they're all available for you. And every morning, we stream out another prayer cast with worship and with Scripture, the Lord's Prayer in Psalm 23. Why? Because we want to focus our prayer life and our minds on the truth so that we have a filter to discern the truth when we encounter it anywhere else in the world. Jesus said in John 16, when the Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So in addition to being on the lookout, we should be praying, Holy Spirit, guide me in the truth, trusting that he will. It's his mission. It's his job. Jesus said so. Our culture is fixated on what is trending, what is popular, what's getting the most clicks and likes and views, or what works for you. But here the word of God, the Apostle Paul to the Philippians and to us, is calling us to focus not on what's trending, not on what's popular, not on what works for you, but on what is true. Okay, we've got to move quicker now to get through this list of eight. Second, Paul says whatever is honorable. This means noble, respectable. The word means that which inspires reverence or awe. That which is worthy of nobility and honor. 
I remember years ago when Prince Harry, who's married now and kind of settled down, but he was sort of the royal bad boy for a while. And there are all these stories about him doing bad boy things. And one particular story came out about him playing strip poker in Las Vegas. And it was all over the tabloids, all over the news, both in, in Great Britain and in America. And why is this a story? Why was it a scandal? Certainly, young single guys doing stupid, sinful things in Vegas, Sin City, doesn't always make the news. It's going on all the time. Why, why was that a scandal? Because he's a prince. Because he's royalty. Because his behavior was beneath the level of his nobility. There's a sense in which Paul is saying the same thing to us here. Whatever is honorable, whatever is worthy of honor, think about these things. Because you and I, if you belong to Jesus, are sons and daughters of the king. Think about what's honorable in his sight, in his name. Next, whatever is just, Paul says. The Greek word here is the same word used for righteousness. Right, correct, in accord with God's standards of righteousness. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there, there's so much injustice in the world, so much of it, and there's so much unrighteousness. We see it every day. We're bombarded with it, and it can weigh heavy on our minds and hearts, mine too. And we should not ignore it. This is not a call to put your head in the sand and pretend like there's no pain or injustice in the world. As Christ followers, we should be the first to call out injustice, the first to work against racial injustice and for God's vision of righteousness in the world. But there's also a great deal of good in the world, a great deal of justice in the world. And perhaps one of the best ways to combat injustice is to call out, recognize justice when we see it, when we encounter it, going on all around us. One of the ways we can call out injustice is to point out justice and righteousness. But, you know, we're not conditioned to see it. Our culture has conditioned us to always look for the bad because justice and righteousness is not reported on. It doesn't make the news. It doesn't make headlines. I remember when John Krasinski, uh, uh, the actor from The Office, had a Facebook uh, show called uh, Now for Some Good News, SGN, Some Good News, and he would have this little show which kids and adolescents and uh, young and old alike loved it because he just looked around the culture and world on the internet for some good news, some good things. People serving each other, loving each other, acting in just and merciful ways. Let's be those kind of people who both act and see and recognize and meditate on what is just. Next, whatever is pure, free from corruption, unstained, the word usually refers to ceremonial purity in the temple, but here it means moral purity. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says that, that those of that us that have impure thoughts won't inherit the kingdom of God. Focus our minds on what is pure. What if we just use this one virtue, purity, as a filter? What if there was an app on your phone or your Netflix account that you could activate and it was the purity filter and it would just filter out anything on whatever you're going to stream on Amazon Prime or Netflix that wasn't pure according to God's standard? I was thinking about that this week. I wonder what would be left for me to watch? Not much. Maybe a documentary or two. Not much. Whatever is pure. Next, whatever is lovely, pleasing, beautiful, producing affection. Whatever makes you exclaim, oh, isn't that beautiful? Whatever makes you cry out. Quite frankly, lately it's fall colors. You know, I have to admit that when, when the wind blows and the rain uh, falls, I get nervous because it means the colors are going to fall off the trees faster. And I love this time of year, but it's, it's fleeting. It doesn't stay. I believe Robert Frost wrote a poem about that, Nothing Gold Can Stay. And, and there's a sort of a, a, a longing for it to stay. And I love the fall colors. And I have to admit, sometimes uh, when I see a beautiful bright orange, gold, or red tree and, and the fall sunshine hitting it, it does make me want to exclaim, look how beautiful, and attribute that to God. Last year, my wife and I were on a marriage retreat in Maine. And as much as the Midwest has good colors, there's just nothing like the Northeast for just incredible fall colors. Every time we turned around, every drive we took, every walk we took, we were exclaiming to each other, how beautiful, how beautiful. The, the Greek word is prosphiles, and it means beauty that calls forth something from within us. It's a borrowed term from Greek philosophy. Whatever's lovely, whatever's beautiful, think about those things and the author of those things. 
Next, whatever is commendable. Evoking admiration, that which is worth commending, of good repute. The Greek word is euphema. It's where we get our English word euphemism from. And it it means well reported of or to speak accurately or well of. Euphemism meaning the same as. Psalm 145 verse 4. One generation will commend your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. So some things that are commendable is God's creation. We just talked about fall colors. Is things we see in his mighty acts in the created order in the world. And then in in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a fellow servant of the church. So we can also see people as commendable, that which is worthy of commendation, mentioning, well done. You reflect the character of God when you serve that way, when you speak that way, when you live that way. Both people and creation and things may be commendable. Paul says, be on the lookout. Think about what is commendable. Now, after this list of six, Paul changes the sentence structure here a little bit. And in the next two sentences, he begins not with whatever is, but with if anything is, or if there is anything. And he moves now to a little different way of describing. And I think these next two words are really summations of the the whole list. He says, if there is any excellence, whatever is excellent, moral goodness, virtue of the highest character or quality, the Greek word is arete. Again, borrowed from Greek philosophy. Excellence that exalts and glorifies God for the Christian and not ourselves. This is an important distinction. Excellence, not so that we're praised for being excellent or great job, but excellence that honors the God who gave us these abilities. Now, we don't all have the same level of gifts and resources and abilities. So I think the best way to think about excellence is the very best you have you can do with what God has given you is excellence and worthy of focusing our minds and our hearts and our attention on. Excellence of character and excellence of outcome. Our culture trains us to worry most about excellence of outcome. Does, is it, does, it, does it produce? Does it work? Is it excellent in terms of the final product? And, you know, the means justify the ends. Not according to the Bible. Excellence of character, moral character and virtue and excellence of outcome have to go together. Finally, if there's anything worthy of praise, praiseworthy, that which moves us to praise God, what a great summation for the whole list, that which moves us to give praise to God. C.S. Lewis says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but it completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. He says the world rings with praise. And this is true, isn't it? We praise the things we delight in. We praise our children when they do something wonderful. We praise, we say, did you see that movie? Have you read this book? What a great sunset. What an amazing thing. What a great vacation we had. We praise these things. We can't help it. We just do it. Paul is calling us here. All that calls that up and out of us is praiseworthy because God made it so. And ultimately, to give him praise. This is all really pointing us to the one who is worthy of our praise. Jesus. Because Jesus is true. Jesus is honorable. Jesus is just. Jesus is pure, lovely, commendable, excellent. And Jesus is praiseworthy. So all of these things that we see in the scriptures and in life, the common everyday experience of life, are pointing us to him. They're reflections of him. Okay, let me just give you two questions for discernment to help you think about, are you focusing your minds on the right things? First, is it consistent with Scripture? Does this thing that I think is commendable or just or excellent, is it consistent with the Word of God? Second, does it exalt Christ? Does it cause me to want to praise Jesus? There is a critical distinction. Paul's calling us to think and to meditate. And Eastern meditation is the emptying of our minds, just emptiness for emptiness' sake. That's not Christian meditation. Christian meditation is not emptiness, but to empty ourselves of the wrong things that we might be filled with the right things. Christian meditation is not to empty yourself, but to fill yourself with the thoughts of God. The Christian life is not just about avoiding the bad, but being filled with the good. Those have to go together. You know, I love that in verse 8, 
There's no negative statements. It's all positive. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is just, whatever is commendable, honorable, excellent, praiseworthy, lovely, these things. It's only focused on the good. I, I, I have to confess that I am prone to always be asking, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this lesson? What's wrong with this show? What's wrong with this idea or this person's book? I'm, I'm a critic in my own mind all the time. And there's a place for being discerning and critical. But I, I think I need to grow. Maybe you do as well. And not always asking what's wrong with that, but starting to ask what's right about that. To start being the kind of person whose my knee-jerk reaction is to look for the good, to look for the glimpses of God in all things. Even if it's mostly bad, <laughs> to find that glimmer. Too many of us are only concerned about what we are keeping out too many Christians historically have been worried mostly about keeping the wrong things out. And we're not concerned enough with putting the right things in, the good things in. I want to let as much beauty and glory and goodness and excellence into my mind and into my life as I possibly can. Don't you? Don't you want to have your mind and more full of the good, of what's just and lovely and excellent and praiseworthy? That's what Paul's calling you to. Paul's writing this from prison. He's writing to a, a group of people that are on the, on the precipice of facing unimaginable persecution. And he's saying, focus your minds, fill your minds with these things because you're going to need it. You're going to need it. Okay, now let's move to verse 9 because Paul, Paul doesn't just leave us with mental exercise. As I said, this is not just the power of positive thinking. Paul's not just calling us like the, just to do this private meditation exercise. How we think, what fills our minds, translates into who we become and how we live. So let's read verse 9 one more time. Philippians 4, verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Do you remember in verse 7, Paul says that the peace of God will guard you. Here he says the God of peace will be with you. So the God of peace who gives us the peace of God to guard us is with us when we practice these things. The Christian life is not just a mental exercise. It, it's, it's meditation that leads to action. We think on these things so that we might live and act on these things. And those things have to go together. The Greek word here for practice is the word prasso. It means to exercise, perform, or carry out, to repeat. It's the word used for athletes in training, repetition. I remember playing football in high school. We couldn't get this play right. And my, my coach, we, we made us run it over and over and over and over again. In fact, it was getting dark and we didn't have lights. And he had people bring their cars and shine the headlights on the field. So we just keep repeating this play, pounding it into us. Why? Because reprodu repetition produces something. In us. Paul's saying, what you have seen and heard and, and received from me, practice, repeat, stay with it, these things. That which you're meditating on and focusing your mind on, put into practice in your life. Now, he uses this phrase, learned and received, and then heard and seen. I'm going to take those in two parts. Learned and received. Whatever you've learned and received from me, this is really kind of one packaged way of talking about something very specific. The word for learned is the Greek word mathetes. It's, it means disciple. It's where we get our word for disciple. Paul, or student, or learner. Paul's saying, those of you who are learners and students of Jesus, you've learned something from me and received something from me. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, the apostle Paul says, what I received, I passed on to you. This is a direct reference to that which we pass on, the apostolic tradition, the teaching of, of Jesus, the teaching of the disciples, what we would call the New Testament tradition, passed down and to us which we pass on. Paul's saying, you've received this from me, the good news, the gospel, the teaching of the scripture. And then he says, what you have heard and seen in me, meaning look at my life, examine me, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Put those two things together. We have learned and received something. We are learning and receiving something. The, the, the testimony of Christ in Scripture. And we have the witness of the lives of the saints in Scripture and in the world. I would think about my own life. Paul says, what you've heard and seen in me. 
Can I say that? Can you say that about your life? What you've heard and seen from me, put into practice? Now, Paul finishes by bringing us back to the God of peace. He says, when you do these things, the God of peace will be with you. You might remember in verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, the Lord is at hand. The presence of God is the surrounding, it's, it's the surrounding reality of these verses. Paul says, finally, I want you to fill your minds with these things, the character of Christ, wherever you see it in the world. Be thinking and meditating on these things. And I want you to think deeply about what you have been given and what you witness in the lives of those who have followed him before you. And I want you to put that into practice. And when you do that, fill your mind with the thoughts of God and the best you can live out those things in your life. The God of peace is with you. He's with you. All right, back to our challenge before we close. Friends, I just want to remind you, this week, as you go from here, whatever your day holds, and this week, all week long, let verses 8 and 9 be the filter by which God examines your life. Not to make you guilty or feel bad. I'm sure some of you are thinking, boy, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not full of a lot of God's thoughts. Well, that's God's mercy to even, that you'd even recognize that. Maybe this week you begin to filter out some of those things. You can lay them aside, a little less time just mindlessly watching the screen or scrolling through your newsfeed. A little more time reflecting deeply on his word and on his goodness in the world. There's a lot of bad news. I see it, you see it. There's a lot of reasons to be full of anxiety and fear and despair. But God says to us, fill your minds with thoughts of who I am and what I'm doing in the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and, and bless you that you do not leave us to our own devices. You told us in Philippians chapter 1 that what you began in Christ, you will continue in us. That means we're all works in progress, God. None of us get this right. And we confess that we often fill our minds with a lot of the wrong stuff, a lot of garbage. Forgive us for that. Give us the prompting of your spirit this week that we might lay aside some of those influences and begin to fill our minds with things that are true, that are right, that are just, commendable, that are lovely, that are excellent and praiseworthy, that we might reflect your character in the world. And then help us, God, to live that way for your sake and for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey, I want to say again, thanks for joining us uh, for worship this morning, uh, whenever you're tuning in. And before the benediction, just want to call out to those of you who might need prayer for any reason. Perhaps you're struggling in some